Okay. So I just want to be sure. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I can't do it while you're sharing. So. Yep. I just want to make sure that you can see my slides. Yep. I can just. Oh, I've got people coming in now. I'll stop sharing that. And then yeah, you should be able to start sharing your slides now. Oops, bring it up here. Let me see before I do. Yeah, so I want to do this. I'm going to share my screen one and start my. Can you see my first slide? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. Good. Our so son maybe lives. We wait. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. My son lives in Australia, so uh, um, we uh, talk over Zoom and all sorts of things uh, regularly. Okay, then I think now that we have been uh, two minutes uh, over the yep. starting time, we can start our session. I would like to welcome everybody to the combined workshop, workshop session of the MBC4IS and the Imobi workshop. We're going to have two C4IS talks today and one Imobi talk. And uh, we start with a BC4IS workshop, which stands for Blockchain for Information Systems. And it's my pleasure to welcome the first speaker, Graham Gell, who has given a talk on ontology-driven audit using the RIA ontology. And this is a work in which smart contracts are kind of supported with the help of uh, blockchain and distributed ledger technology. So Graham, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I want to, um, and I know we're a little bit late, so I want to make sure we sort of proceed so everybody has their allotted time. But uh, this is sort of the, uh, the outline of uh, our talk and Monique is going to give the uh, uh, section two and then, uh, but to start off, I wanted to um, make it you know, sort of give you an idea of, uh, for those of you who are not, I'm in the business school, and uh, um, while my background is computer science, I've worked with auditors a, a, a great deal. So I just want to give you an idea of what an audit is for those of you who are not um, intimately familiar with the concept. First of all, it's defined as a process and a formal organized series of steps designed to achieve um, two objectives. There are a couple things in here, formal. Okay, an audit is not, you know, I'm going to look at things. If you, if you uh, read the auditing literature and the standards on auditing, which are both uh, US and internationally based, um, you have to have a well designed set of steps and objectives for each of your steps. Um, the first way in which we can achieve um, assurance um, in an audit is. Um, and answering the question of whether financial statements ac accurately reflect the values from the information system. And um, that can be done um, in sort of two ways. Uh, first is to, to um, go out and observe, for instance, observe physical inventories. And <coughs> that is one of the requirements of an audit <coughs> is to actually observe taking of physical inventories and confirm what's called accounts receivable. The other way is within um, what we call, uh, so that's substantive auditing, compliance auditing looks at controls and 
um, that can, uh, and it's sort of the basis of this uh, work, is that it can look at the uh, way in which controls are both designed and operationalized, <clears throat> which means that um, I, uh, I want to know, um, I have all these numbers, are the processes which gave those numbers correct? And then the second way in which we um, audit is does the information system accurately reflect the relevant operational aspects of the organization? And so um, we have sort of these two um, things that have to be uh, satisfied. Our work looks at both the design and operational issues. And it, while we, we, uh, the focus of uh, financial statement audits are the financial statements, um, there are many aspects to which those numbers are derived. And that's what the basis of our work is on um, how the numbers are derived and how the operational and design and control over that. So Monique, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And this is the first slide for Monique. Okay, thank you very much, Graham. So um, what we are trying to, to, to propose here in the paper is a way to um, say, um, do the auditing of software and how software has been designed. Um, if you look at the, at the traditional way of developing software, what happens is you have some kind of high level requirements. You make some detailed analysis of those requirements. And then eventually uh, this will result in the design of software. This software will be coded and tested. Um, of course, along the way, you will find certain mistakes so the testing doesn't run as you would like it to run. Um, you, you have to just, um, yeah, just a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, somebody comes pick up something in my office. Sorry for that. <laughs> so when you test the software and it's not okay, um, you can change the code. If you see that there's a mistake in the code that, that has its source in the design, you can go back to the design and, and adjust the design. Um, and, and so you have also a very iterative uh, process. Also, uh, definitely when you do agile development, for example. But what happens is that the, the documents you started from or the the, the the analysis and the requirements, they might evolve while you are developing software. And what rarely happens is that you um, go back to the description of those requirements analysis and you, you fix the documentation of those requirements and analysis so as to correctly reflect the code. So at the end of the process, you do have software code, but you do not have a high level trustable description that you can say, okay, if I want to understand how the code works and how it has been designed, I can just rely on those documents and I'm sure that those reflect accurately um, how the code is. That's not happening today. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, we can compare that to the model-driven engineering way of working. In model-driven engineering, um, the idea is that when you create, um, when you have your requirements from those requirements, you create the so-called models. Um, and in particular, they are called platform independent models as a result of a detailed analysis. And these models are then transformed to a design and the design is transformed into code. And I'm saying transformed because it's not a hand crafting of design and code, but the transformation is based on a set of rules that are made explicit and that then are run in an algorithmic, algorithmic way. And so the idea is that you don't handcraft code, but that you rely on a analysis and the result of formal specification resulting from the analysis and that you transform that to code. As a result of that, when you have your software, you do have an accurate description of how it was designed in these platform independent models and these platform specific models. So that's a big change compared to the handcrafting of software. So maybe we can go to the next slide. So the basic ingredients are here, the platform independent model, which is describing the system from a business perspective. Um, and you will, uh, using certain transformation rules, transform it into a platform specific model. So geared to, for example, the use of JavaScript or the React framework or Node.js or, or C++ or C Sharp or whatever you want to use. 
and you still describe it in a fairly abstract way, but already geared towards um, your platform. And then eventually you will transform it to code. And at the bottom, you see the chain. So you start from your platform independent model. You have your transformation tool that where you plug in the transformation definition, you obtain your platform specific models, and then you plug in another set of transformations to obtain the code. So if you want to, uh, check how your code was designed, what you need to do is you need to check your platform independent model and you need to check your transformations. Okay, next slide. So um, in particular, if we look at a method to make this work, uh, we can look at the Merode method and the B Merode method, which is uh, an extension of the Merode method for blockchain development. And so we define there our platform independent model using a UML class diagram, uh, state charts and a coordination matrix. And then specifically for the blockchain, we add a few of those matrices to, to take care of specific topics that we need to also design for a blockchain. And then um, in the case of the Miro, the tools, you have a transformation engine that um, goes directly from the PIM to the code. So the, the platform specific model is implicit. And at this moment, we have a transformation to generate a Java application and to generate a REST service interface that wraps it. We can also have a default user interface for that. And in BMIRO, the case, we can uh, also transform to the Hyperledger platform. So that would be the development cycle for Merode. Yeah, I'm sorry, did you want to go to the next slide? Yeah, so here you see just an example. So these are the, the, the XML, so the diagrams that you would make, you will store them in an XML file. Um, we use a Velocity, which is an open source platform uh, for defining templates. So our transformations are actually templates. And then you have an engine that takes the content from the XML uh, files, feeds that into the templates, and that way you obtain uh, the Java code. And so besides the, the, the graphical interface, you also have this REST interface, and it's actually the same way of working that you can use. Okay, and that's it, I think, for me, Graham. I pass it on to yeah. you. <clears throat> so <clears throat> here is the model that we are uh, looking at. This is the REA ontology. Um, we have a uh, monograph coming out <clears throat> that um, more completely describes. This is also described in uh, certain components of it um, in ISO 15944, that series of uh, um, international standards. And there's been a great deal of work um, published on uh, both the state machine mechanics and um, implementation, um, uh, you know, using uh, various um, database engines and uh, data modeling um, tools. And the, the, what we wanted to achieve in this is a more formal way of converting this kind of ontology or this one in specific into um, smart contracts. And there are a couple things about it that I'm going to, um, that I am more interested in from this work, or we're more interested in this work. And that is this connection between the types, the resource types, and the resources, and the agents, and economic agent types, and the agents. There are other things that um, would be of interest uh, for other groups, but this, this particular project is trying to focus on these, this is um, for this. And let me explain that, okay? Um, when we write a contract, we specify a type that is a type of resource. So I don't say I want that particular car, and I don't say I want that particular person building the car. I say that I want a car with these specifications and an agent with these credentials. And the contract fulfills these with instances. So there's an actual car, there's an actual person, you know, that does the final inspection. And um, we want to be able to measure and define in the software the correctness of this fulfillment. So the question is, does the car instance match the car type specified? And we also have to discuss what are the measurement criteria. And so tell me exactly what it, that is. Now, in a, in a smart contract, you can't say, well, you know, I wish I had, we, we want to specify, you know, I go to the car dealer and I say, I'm not going to accept that car because 
um, you know, the door latch isn't uh, the way I wanted it, or it doesn't, or whatever, the windshield. Those are not possible when we start to smart contracts because the fulfillment of types has to be completely specified. So when the instance is delivered, I can match it and say, yes, this matches it. And you can't go back and say, well, you know, I didn't really, I, I don't, that color is not what I wanted. The co smart contracts don't allow that. And so we need to have measurement criteria that, that when the instance arise, I can actually and, and exactly measure whether or not it came. And so um, when we talk about resource types and instances, we need to have something in the software that can match that. Um, now, the other part that is particularly important for smart contracts, contracts on the blockchain, is the agent fulfillment. Does the person you know, performing the final inspection, I said, match the agreed upon type of person? So let's say, you know, and this is an instance that happened in the United States, um, was the final inspection performed by a certified engineer? And you know, we have an apartment complex, which this is gonna come, right? So how is this verified? Because the company who sent the engineer simply get to say, um, yes, the person that we sent has those credentials and um, we have certified them. Or can I use an Oracle um, to go into the, um, look at the, you know, the company's database, look at the training, look at, you know, uh, projects they've done and satisfy myself or satisfy the contract that that has been um, fulfilled correctly. Did the person that you sent out to give my final inspection actually have a certified uh, a certification that I would want. So these two fulfillment issues need to be resolved if smart contracts are going to be used um, extensively um, to verify uh, um, fulfillment. Um, audit can be used, as I said before, with substantive and compliance tests, but for design issues, and this is what we are addressing in this work, is, is the process verified? Is the measurement of the fulfillment co correctly included in the smart contract? Is that part of the model done correctly? Can I be assured that the way in which fulfillment is handled in the smart contract done the way that I would want it to happen? And can I audit that? Are the remedies, and this is important, this is what we call the unhappy path. Are the remedies correctly included in the smart contract? Um, the mismatch of a car to a specified car. You know, each mismatch, mismatch may have a discount indicated. Have I said, if it doesn't come on Tuesday and it comes on Wednesday, um, what is the remedy this? And I can't add those later on um, because the contract, once the contract is fulfilled, once the contract says I've, I've carried out my part of the, you know, I've, I've measured and completed that, I can't go back and say, um, wait a minute, maybe we should add this. And is the final inspection not carried out by the, is the smart contract voided? What are the conditions? Now, <clears throat> this is also an audit term and it's called materiality. And so I have to understand and, and be able to deal with significance of the mismatches. And, and uh, in the ontology, the, the work that's coming out, the research monograph, we talk um, not extensively because this is situation specific, but it has to be coded in there. How significant are the mismatches? Does the, if the color doesn't match exactly, if the tires on the car are not exact, if the software engineer that specifies, all those things, the, those mismatches can't be ed, um, done after the fact. They have to be coded in there. And that's what we're uh, attempting to address. Are there any questions? I think we've done our come back at the right time, right? Finished. Questions? First of all, thank you very much for your talk. Graham and Monique, your um, before time, you would have had uh, three more minutes, actually. Uh, well, those we are for your questions. I'm sure there's yeah. lots of them, right? And yet we've got one raised so. hand. Laura? I can unmute. Oh, yeah. There we go, Victor. Uh, okay, great. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. 
Okay, great. So uh, first of all, uh, Graham and uh, Monique, thank you very much for the uh, interesting presentation. Um, I also read the paper and I thought you had a nice way of, uh, an elegant way of integrating ontology engineering, model-driven engineering and, um, and auditing. So I thought it was really interesting, but uh, and I did, didn't have any really question about what was written in the paper, but I was wondering, say you want to put that in practice um, in a company, how does it really change? Would it be correct to say that the, the financial auditors would then become a bit more of IT auditors um, than, than financial auditors? If they, if they focus on checking that your uh, system does not allow performing things that should not be allowed instead of verifying afterwards if all the rules that needed to be respected are indeed uh, respected um, in the data. Well, okay, so if you look at the evolution of auditing, um, it, you know, initially it was um, counting physical inventories, okay, and, and but as you um, start to see the, the complexity of organizations um, increasing, um, it is very clear and, they ha and audit firms now have staffs to do IT auditing, okay, because it is um, and I have another paper coming out, it is probably not possible to go and count everything at, you know, Boeing or Airbus or General Motors or whatever. So you can't do that anymore. So now you have to rely on um, the way in which the numbers were captured and the way in which the financial statements were created. And that is a software issue. Um, and so, uh, the, the, you know, um, the, the one thing that uh, um, has changed is that um, as complex or, you know, you have to deal with the complexity and the only way um, auditors have to deal with the complexity is to deal with the software that's generating those. If they start to try and count every engine at General Motors, it's just not going to work. So you have to rely on the processes that created those numbers. And most of those are now embedded in software at some point. It doesn't mean that you still don't have to verify, um, you know, how the people were hired and go and look and, and take a sample of the people that are hired. You probably have to do that as well. But you cannot rely on counting anymore. Yeah, okay. Okay, so in general, we are more headed towards towards uh, checking in the systems than than in, in the real world, physically. Oh okay. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, well thank you. Uh, most of my students end up in that, you know, um, doing. If I have students in my class who are hoping to go, to, you know, and they tell me that, um, you know, I'm not really good with computers, um, my answer is, oh, don't worry, I've heard General Motors is going back to paper and pencils pretty soon. And they go, really? <laughs> and I say, no, never. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Well, thank you very much for, for, uh, for your answer. And again, for the presentation. Any other questions? Thank you very much for listening. Um, yeah, if Sergio has a question, I see. Oh, uh, and we have Sarah. another. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see you raised hands. Yeah, we have, oh, oh, we have plenty right. of time. Okay, I didn't want to cut off the, you know, going first, you never want to cut off the second and third presentations. <laughs> yes, Sergio? Sergio, we cannot hear you, unfortunately. Let's see what's in the chat. It's your turn to yeah. ask a question. You want me to ask your question, Sergio, for you? What is that behind me? Uh, that's Uluru. Was that your question? No, thank you. <laughs> well, um, maybe in the meantime, until we can hear Sergio, um, maybe a slightly provocative question from my side, and I think that was already touched in the question before. Um, aren't smart contracts, in fact, programs stored in a distributed ledger? And aren't they, if, if they are just programs and not really contracts in a, in a business sense, um, isn't the, the verification of smart contracts not rather a, a software technological question? So shouldn't we rather apply 
those existing verification techniques from software engineering to, uh, to, to auditing uh, smart contracts rather than your approach? That would be my question. Monique, you wanna? Um, but uh, yeah, I think you start from the assumption that smart contracts are software stored on a general on a distributed ledger. But I think it's not not just about the software; it's also the data that you're storing on the because you store the transactions on the mm -hmm. on the distributed general ledger. But still, the way you design there's of course a, a large software component that defines how the how the whole system is going to work. And I think that's the point we're trying to make is that if you want to check how the smart contracts work, it's like Graham said, you need to check the whole process, the, how the machine is working, you could say. And so that's, that's the point is then if you want to check the design of that machine of, of all this processing, you can either dive into the code, that's one option, or you can check how the design, the code was designed Oh, and there, how proposal is to base the design on something like an accepted ontology and to use certified maybe transformations to transform this platform independent model into code. And then you don't have to dive into the code anymore. In, in like the, the bright future, you could imagine that you, you certify your platform independent models and you, you have like certified models and maybe you can derive the one that you need from such a certified model and then certify this derivation and use a certified transformation to transform your model into code. And then you have software that is certified without having to dive into the code. Because I think the way we check our software now is also by doing exhaustive testing, by doing code inspection, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But well, that could also be yeah. changed. Well, and if you, if you read the software engineering literature, at least the way I'm familiar with it, <clears throat> there is no 100% um, certification of software and that's why most software has an end user license agreement which says we're not responsible if something screws up okay and mm -hmm. that first of all i also want to make one more comment about the term um distributed um ledger um there's an iso coming out which calls it a distributed transaction repository it is not a ledger it becomes integrated into a financial statement our general ledger, but it is not a general ledger. It is a transaction repository. So now we are concerned with, one, how did the transactions on that blockchain, which are immutable and can't be changed, get there? And because once they're there, you can't say, wait a minute, we made a mistake, refork the blockchain, get rid of that transaction. I didn't really mean to accept that car or whatever it is. You. You, you know, that is not a recipe for a, a future of blockchains where we do supply chains and we are talking about, you know, 600 million transactions an hour. That's just not going to work to say, let's refork it. Okay. So this becomes the only, I would argue, and you know, of course, because it's our work, but I would argue that the future is about certifying how the transactions got there and having confidence that what's out there is first of all, what really happened. I can't, you know, I can't fake that the car actually arrived. Uh, I can't fake that really some person actually inspected the building. I have to be able to certify that those transactions have validity and are um, integrity. Okay, thank you very much for this extensive answer. Also, Monique, uh, thank you for pointing out the, the model-driven, the importance of the model-driven uh, engineering approach here. Um, yeah, so th uh, then uh, our question round is over. Thanks again, the authors, also for answering your questions. And we come to our next presentation of today which is called Trust Sico, a distributed infrastructure for providing trust in the software ecosystem. And it's being uh, given by Fang Hu, was also written by Siamak Fashidi and by Slinger Janssen. And I'd like to point out that I'm uh, happy that uh, a member of Utrecht University 
uh, is given the talk and two members of Utrecht University have uh, written that paper because I'm also from Utrecht University. So, Fang, um, please share your screen with us. Uh, sure, a second. You can um, see your screen. Can I see the screen? Yep, all good. Yes. Uh, cool, let's start. Um, uh, uh, so you have the word. Uh, sorry? Please go ahead, you have the word. Ah, cool. Um, so, um, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Fong from Yushan University. Currently, I'm a PhD student uh, working with uh, Slinger. Um, and uh, today, I'm glad to be here to introduce our uh, Transico. Uh, is a, a distributed infrastructure uh, for uh, providing trust in the software ecosystem. Uh, this is the agenda. Firstly, I will provide some background why we have this project. Secondly, I will focus on the uh, Transico infrastructure along with uh, three major components, uh, distributed ledger uh, technology, uh, trust score calculation mechanism, um, and uh, alert system. Uh, after that, I will talk about how we evaluate the, uh, the infrastructure. And at the end, uh, I will provide some uh, project status and future work. Uh, before I start to introduce the, uh, the background, I have some questions to all of you, but you don't need to answer. Uh, do you struggle to use like uh, a third party software component, or do you have uh, experience to choose a uh, software package? Any special version uh, do you consider, or just like the, the, the latest one? Uh, uh, software uh, ecosystem is a set of actors functioning as a unit and uh, interacting as a shared market for software uh, and services together with the relationship among them. Uh, now, um, um, it uh, become in, uh, indispensable in our daily work life. Uh, however, the software ecosystem, uh, which should be full of trust, now is full of pitfalls. Uh, for example, the, the, the rise of uh, supply chain attacked which is uh, uh, which target a uh, target adder is source code, um, update mechanism, um, and uh, build process of the third party software. Here we present the uh, package manager um, ecosystem, um, and a slightly uh, existing uh, supply chain attack vectors. The number behind the uh, vector name. Uh, represent the stages at uh, which may occur in this uh, package manager uh, package manager ecosystem. From here, we can find the attacks can carry out at any stage from one to four. Um, the most common type of attack is uh, type of squatting. Uh, it is an indirect um, uh, attack vector uh, that take advantage of typos when developer uh, uh, trying to search some popular component. Uh, for instance, um, if the uh, developer types lodash when their intended is uh, lodash, then they may um, accidentally install a malicious component with a similar name. Uh, here, we, uh, we, we, can, we can see from this chart, according to the uh, state of uh, supply chain, uh, software supply chain 2020 report, there has been 430% increase in the deep server uh, attacks on open source software in the last year. And the number continues to raise now. It is reported that the supply chain uh, attack, uh, attack vectors rose by 42% in the first quarter of 2021 in, U, uh, in the US, uh, impacting up to 7 million people. And currently we are in the fifth generation server attacks, which is a large scale uh, multi-vector that is designed to infect multi-components in the software ecosystem. It's a hyper faster than the traditional security system can handle. 
uh, and even the uh, the the subprime has its own social networks with uh, stories, uh, malware can be licensed and uh, get tech support. Uh, however, many organizations security levels are lagging at the second or the third uh, generation maturity struggling, uh, they're struggling to, to keep up with the latest attack uh, sophistication and development part of speed. Um, here we have another uh, uh, survey uh, in 2020 of around 700 uh, uh, developers, which uh, the results reveal that uh, only uh, 51 of the organizations, uh, sorry, for, uh, 14 uh, organizations can be aware of awareness within one day. And uh, the most part uh, is around 51% uh, percent of the organizations require more than one week to detect and respond to the, to the attack and awareness. Um, so the focus on to, uh, to address this type of uh, cybersecurity should, uh, should use the advanced application awareness and external threat intelligence feeds, uh, which will uh, provide uh, both uh, developer and uh, software end user with a uh, live stream of data uh, related to potential uh, or uh, current threats. Uh, TrustCycle uh, is designed to solve the issues uh, from these two perspectives. And this is the TrustCycle infrastructure. Uh, TrustCycle uh, is a community managed uh, the infrastructure that underpins the uh, software ecosystem with a uh, trust layer. The infrastructure gathers data on trust in particular software packages and projects. With, uh, with this, uh, uh, with this uh, data, software end users can determine uh, whether the package versions are reliable, uh, contain vulnerability, and trusted by, uh, by other end users. There are three uh, sources for uh, for a trust fact. Uh, the observer client uh, will executed by the participant in the uh, trust vehicle as mechanism to add fact to the distributed ledger. Um, and it work uh, with um, the, the observer client will work with uh, package managers to monitor the software and the user's local environment for new trust facts. Uh, when these new facts are uh, a submitted uh, set of items will be checked, such as the submitter's uh, trustworthiness and their observations. The trust files can be get from the external trust uh, file trust database as well, such as uh, library.io and some other uh, databases like CVD and uh, 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 NVD. Uh, which for some vulnerability and tech uh, databases. Um, uh, and currently we uh, have a, a, a challenge is how to uh, how to how to uh, determine and handle these trusted uh, uh, third party databases. Uh, so firstly we uh, plan to conduct a set of interviews and surveys to identify which databases are trusted by the experienced organizations, um, developers, and end users. Next, uh, next, we will regularly identify which databases are trustworthy uh, through a consensus algorithm. Uh, and we will, we will adopt uh, oracles to incorporate the database in the real world to, uh, to our distributed ledger. And another data source is from different stakeholders. The main uh, stakeholders um, are software end users who install and use the, uh, the software, software packages and package managers, uh, and the software uh, providers who create those products. Uh, and uh, they two will uh, submit their uh, trust facts from their different perspectives. Um, and all trust Fact will be stored in the uh, distributed ledger. Yeah. Um, 
In terms of why we select uh, this uh, distributed ledger technology, uh, firstly, as the community needs to rely on a trustworthy source, we uh, propose uh, trust data can be collected and shared through a consensus mechanism uh, where perception of a uh, software component or package will become more reliable and complete as more participants can share their uh, trust back. And secondly, we um, the, uh, the, the trust legal platform uh, can be maintained by the community. Um, this is because the, uh, the open source communities are good at self-cleansing uh, through transparency and communal solution funding. So we suppose the ledger can be sustained um, itself through the contribution from those communities. Uh, and we envision a distributed autonomous organization DAO, uh, to enable people to coordinate and govern themselves by a set of uh, self-executing groups developed in, in our dis distributed ledger. And we will design uh, incentives to encourage more uh, stakeholders to join, uh, to join uh, this platform, uh, such as they can assign uh, some uh, exclusive data when the participants uh, provide uh, hardware uh, for the project. And the design for the ledger is uh, significant. Um, firstly, uh, it's a challenge to design or choose a consensus algorithm uh, which could best uh, suit our distributed ledger. We need to find a balance between the cost of network and uh, a healthy uh, consensus size. And secondly, the distributed ledger networks must be uh, confidential, which will help us to eliminate some um, commercial interest, the commercial interest from uh, trust corruption. And finally, we need to um, design mechanisms to allow the ledger to be maintained by the community without imposing some significant cost um, to, to, to the uh, ecosystem. Um, so we have this um, requirement to address uh, about challenges. Uh, back to the infrastructure. And uh, we will design uh, a trust score calculation mechanism to calculate the uh, trust score based on the trust fact uh, stored in the distributed ledger. Yeah, this is the uh, um, the some first chart, which is part of the uh, the uh, the SLR, which we are currently working. Uh, it shows some factors we are collecting from the literature, um, and we if you can see. The Clearly, I can zoom in. Yeah. Uh, we use uh, intrinsic factors to uh, uh, to present uh, some physical attributes of a product, and um, it's uh, intrinsic factors uh, to present some external attributes. Intrinsic factors meant for those uh, technical factors. The sig uh, significant consideration is the uh, vulnerability, which it, which will uh, negatively impact the software trust, and quality is another major consideration, uh, such as reliability, maintainability, usability, um, and for the source code here, uh, is for the uh, we consider some programming language uh, or framework. Uh, some indicators could be. Uh, source life codes or number of models. For the extrinsic uh, factors, uh, therefore, those um, uh, external software, uh, software product or, or project, uh, some factors like reputation, popularity, process, and documentation will be measured to consider. And for the human, um, it's meant for the or influence from different stakeholders. 
um, and for the structural assurance, um, is uh, for some license contract and some legal considerations. Uh, cost uh, is not for the return on investment. In this case, uh, some factors uh, like cost of investment, uh, cost of use assessed, uh, time and risk will be not considered. The, the the trust uh the uh, once the trust uh the, the trust goal has been calculated the trust fact and trust goal will be shown to the participants with uh, by the alert system. The um and meanwhile some warnings will be shown to the stakeholders uh, in the system as well. For example, if um if the uh, trust call of a current using package is reduced uh, and any attacked or vulnerability detected, um, alert system will show the relevant information to the participants and the alert system can calculate and find out the package version with some participants requirement along with some situations such as current system and program language. Um, and also, um, it can automatically reconfig um, the system, which means the configurations uh, of a decreasing trust score will be likely to be automatically replaced with a more uh, trusted component by the package managers and our, uh, our system. In terms of the evaluation, um, we need to follow uh, the design size to uh, continually evaluate our artifact. So firstly, we need to discuss with different communities to meet the needs of experts and stakeholders to make uh, our artifact more rational and effective. Uh, secondly, our artifact um, uh, evaluated using uh, technical experiments. We will evaluate the technical performance with real-world data. Um, this approach will help us to identify and address some potential um, performance problems such as uh, response time uh, queries per second. Um, let's move on to the current measures and social work. And Probably we are working on the SOR to determine how uh, software trust is determined in, uh, and, the, uh, and the factors of possibility and negative influence uh, if influence the trust uh, in some literature. And we have developed a, a prototype um, of the trust table infrastructure, which works as a plugin for the, with, with, for the, for the NPM, it will tell NPM to avoid some particular packages or package versions uh, based on the trust data uh, stored in the distributed ledger. Uh, besides that, we have conducted uh, structured interviews with 12 um, software engineers from different domains um, to explore how they uh, perceive the trust during the software package selection. Um, and from the interviews, we, we realize that different stakeholders have different focuses on the uh, software uh, selection. And there is no un a unified uh, selection criteria. So it requires us um, to, to design the trust score. Uh, we should be uh, based, on, based on multiple dimensions. Uh, and uh, definitely it should be uh, customized to use different stakeholders requirements. And in addition, by using DAO cameras to explore how we make the trust infrastructure sustainable and self governing with a bigger DAO. Um, in the future, um, firstly, we will um, create a survey to explore stakeholders' perception of uh, trust DAO uh, calculation. Secondly, we will we are going to develop a, a set of analysis techniques to extract the, the trust from the results. 
such as uh, uh, currently we already have a number of, a member from the team to uh, start the work to instruct the committee from 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 Bihar. And finally, uh, we will continue developing the prototype uh, towards the minimum product or, or experiments with existing action managers. And uh, we, we also provide some, some linkages here. Uh, this, this one is for the uh, for, uh, first prototype. And for Dow Canvas is here. If you have uh, uh, interest, you can raise it. This is reference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we are opening the question round. I think we all are affected by the software ecosystem. We are working with it, benefiting from it, contributing to it. So I think everyone could ask a question here. Go, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Fang, for the, the, the interesting presentation. Uh, I, I also read the paper and I thought you had a, it was a very interesting project. And also, I like the vision that you had of, of trying to build a decentralized autonomous organization so that the project can persist uh, after the academic project. So that's really, uh, really great. Um, <clears throat> but thinking about the discussion we had about the previous paper where uh, Graham was emphasizing the fact that once every something is recorded on the on the ledger, uh, you cannot uh, go back and change it or adjust it. Um, and in the paper, you, you mentioned the idea of having really software engineers having the ability to submit uh, trust facts. But how will you? Um, how can you check that these facts are really accurate um, and uh, that they are really added to the ledger? only once they are really validated and that you're sure it is really true what they are saying. Um, as well, well um, truth and design a consensus algorithm, uh, if, uh, such as if 51% uh, of the participants in the ledger agree with the data, then we'll consider it is will be true or we'll consider it is a trusted uh, data, trust fact. Okay, yeah. So, so every time that someone wants to submit a trust fact, the fact itself needs to be verified by the rest of the network. Then, um, yes, that's true. So, currently, we we still consider the 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 frequency to check the the, the trust fact. And meanwhile, we also need to find a balance between the uh, between the cost of network um, uh, with the constant size. As um, for example, if there uh, there, there uh, the, the the people uh, need to create a project, and there are thousands of components in the project, then it will be uh, it will be a disaster for our distributed ledger. Uh, but Currently, uh, we just uh, need to collect the, the, the questions and need to find the answers and need to find the balance in future. But currently, uh, our project is just a proposal. We only have an idea about the, the, the infrastructure but for the more uh, works will be uh, related to us when, when, when we'll do folks on in future. Okay. Well, great. Thank you for uh, for your answer, and I'm uh, looking forward to see um, how it's going to evolve. Then, um, but thanks again for the presentation and uh, for your answer. Thanks, Victor, for the question. Who else has a question? Well, I like that slide uh, with that sunburst schema showing the, I think, influence factors of the total trust score. Can you maybe further explain how these components that are shown in the sunburst schema 
yeah, how they form a, a combined trust score. So are these all numbers that are that are calculated together to a certain percentages, and then you have a total score, or is there so, something more behind that algorithm that calculates the total trust score? Um, as currently all the uh, trust factors in the sunburst uh, chart uh, are collected from the, the literature, and we do some counting the uh, the ages, the times uh, how, uh, of uh, each uh, trust factors. Uh, but in the future, we will design um, a formula or mechanism to calculate the trust score based on those uh, impact factors. Uh, but definitely, we will have some priority and or some weights assigned to each factors. Uh, but uh, but before that, we need to uh, conduct a survey with the experienced uh, software developers and, and users. How uh, do they consider uh, how or the suggestion about how to calculate the trust score? Actually, we already conduct a, 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 a several interviews with uh, developers from different domains. Uh, they uh, really worry about if uh, the trust um, can be shown by just a number. Uh, so, so currently we're thinking, we can't just provide a number. Uh, relevant trust value should, uh, should be provided. And also different stakeholders have different understanding about the trust, uh, the, the selection criteria, software uh, package uh, selection criteria, and different understanding about the software uh, security. Uh, so our project will be uh, customized uh, to uh, make the different stakeholders can retail based on their different uh, different understandings or considerations. I see, and I assume it's still future research, or it could be a wide range of future research to refine this notion of how do I assess the level of trust and how would I provide this for different stakeholders. Huh? So one could go there into, into very far depth uh, uh, and re refine this notion of what is a trust score, much more than you have it in, in the very moment. Uh, yes. yes. And definitely we will do some testing to uh, evaluate the mechanics and this, this definitely to make it more rational and uh, more rational and correct, but maybe not correct as different people have different standards. So, uh, which means we, we just can provide from uh, some uh, experienced uh, developers or as far as uh, a perspective to, to show the, the result or provide the trust fact. Um, yes. Yes, thank you. That's an interesting part of your project, I think. Okay, yes. So no hand has been risen in the meantime. Oh, Victor, Victor has another uh, last quick question. So Victor, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. I'm going to be very quick. Uh, I saw also that you explained that uh, as, as a user of TrustSeco, you would be able to specify some kind of trust level that you want to have in the packages that you use. And that if at some point one of the packages or a package version falls below the, this threshold, um, then the system could automatically choose another package or another version. Um, and what I was wondering is doing so, how do you ensure that the other version which is being chosen is compatible, uh, that the build will actually work if you use another version of the package than the one you worked with initially? Um, um, the replacement is not mandatory, uh, but which will based on some consideration like the current system and dependency. Dependency is the major part as uh, the holy uh, software packages and package manager, the major score is the dependency. So, but we still need to think about how to do that, but currently it's just a, uh, a vision. We will do that as it, in this case, it will save lots of time. Uh, the, the, the software and the users can 
uh, uh, to install or uh, uh, install the software package. The dependency is the measure thinking uh, consideration when you saw. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you again, Fang, for giving the talk and answering the questions. And this was the BC4IS part of this session. And it's now my pleasure to announce Hüeb Aldeweireld, who together with Tina Mioch has written the paper, Values and Design Methodologies for AI. And this is a contribution to the EMOBI workshop, to the Ethics and Morality in Business Informatics workshop. And yeah, we all know that the more we apply AI in our, in our lives, the more we are confronted with ethical questions. So this is really an important topic to do research on, and this is why we are looking forward to hearing your talk. You have the stage and the word, please. Thank you, Jens. <clears throat> Sorry. So yes, as you said, uh, this is a, a different topic or a different workshop than the previous two talks. Um, I'm going to use a slightly different uh, interpretation of the word value uh, opposed to, uh, to what Graham was talking about. Uh, but it nicely ties into the previous two talks uh, as well as uh, Fang Yui also mentioned trust, trust in systems. This is basically the, the essence of, uh, of why ethics and value sensitive uh, uh, methodologies are required for AI systems. So as Jens said, uh, AI is, is penetrating our society more and more. It's uh, applied in, uh, in many different ways uh, by different organizations and governments, uh, which each uh, application of AI questions also arise on whether we should want AI to do such things. Uh, where, how do we make AI such a way uh, that it does it in a, in a responsible way? Uh, and that's basically the, uh, the essence of what this, uh, this paper is about. So let me see, my slide isn't advancing. So um, this is uh, briefly what I'm going to talk about. I will uh, briefly explain why we're looking into to value sense of, uh, values in, uh, in AI uh, design methodologies. Uh, one of the many mentioned uh, uh, solutions for using values and ethics in AI is value sensitive design, which I will briefly talk about. I will also explain what the shortcomings are of uh, value sensitive design, uh, and I will explain uh, why we want value sensitive design in uh, AI methodologies and which part of that we will focus on in this paper. And of course, I will present how we approach this, the, the issue uh, and the results and some conclusions. So as said, uh, AI is becoming much more uh, uh, prominent in our daily, daily lives. Uh, and we, of course, also uh, want to have systems that we can trust. Uh, and you can see a, a large movement, uh, especially in the European Union, on this ethical aspect of AI on how to create systems or at least to ensure that systems are created in such a way that they adhere to our uh, societal uh, uh, morality and values. Uh, so last year, uh, uh, a, a group of, uh, of experts from the EU proposed uh, seven key requirements that AI systems should, uh, should adhere to uh, in order to be trustworthy systems. This, uh, um, uh, accounts about uh, diversity, uh, sustainability, uh, but also fairness, etc. Uh, and last month, uh, the EU also uh, introduced a proposal for uh, for upcoming legislation. Uh, you can think of this as the GDPR for a AI. Um, so basically, legislation is coming up where any application of AI is going to be. Uh, um, uh, required to be compliant with law uh, on, on uh, a responsible application of, uh, of the particular systems. Of course, uh, the EU isn't the only one that's, uh, that's looking at uh, the, the, the moral application of AI. Uh, there's also the IEEE Global Initiative on uh, uh, ethical application of AI. And there's many more that talk about the, uh, the reasons why uh, ethics and AI are particularly important. Um, so 
on the one hand, uh, AI is, is sort of a, a, sp a special uh, a field of, of computer science. Uh, uh, all systems that are built should be uh, uh, morally responsible, uh, comply with, uh, with social regulations. Uh, but AI in particular, because it's rather complex and the systems that are a result of, uh, of machine learning uh, can be very obscure in how they reach their uh, their answers, they, how they uh, do their calculations. It's uh, even more essential um, that these systems are built in such a way that you can trust whatever is coming out of them. Um, but if you look at the literature on uh, on ethics, on ethics and AI, you see that most of the discussion of ethics and AI is uh, focused on the principles of what is ethics and what is moral in the sense of AI. Um, but there's very little written about the, the practice of, uh, in specific, how, uh, how do you make a system such that it is uh, compliant with, with uh, social uh, uh, desirable outcomes. Uh, and as we're moving forward uh, and this legislation is coming up, uh, it's becoming more and more important that we have means to, to include uh, the, the, the ethics into the, the development process. So uh, to make sure that uh, we comply with, uh, with legal and, and moral regulations uh, by the design of the system instead of by looking at the artifact that is a result of the design. As I mentioned, uh, one of the most uh, uh, proposed uh, solution for including ethics into, uh, into, into development is uh, the value sensitive design uh, framework, which was uh, already uh, 20, proposed 20 years ago by Batja Friedman. Uh, it's the, the, the most mentioned uh, uh, framework for the inclusion of ethics in, in any kind of design process. Uh, and as such also uh, covers AI development. Uh, it's a philosophical approach to, uh, to the inclusion of, uh, of moral values into the design process, and it uses uh, a, a tripartite methodology, briefly explained here on the right, where it uh, investigates the, the, the conceptual, the, the values, the morality that is uh, required for, uh, for the system to adhere to, um, the empirical investigation where it looks at what the stakeholder, the direct and indirect stakeholders actually are, and what they think are the most important values and in which way these values should be in the system. And the technical investigation where you look at uh, what technology can do and how technology can be made to adhere to either one of these. Um, as said, it's a, a philosophical framework which is uh, cross-disciplinary. It uh, not only uh, covers technical studies, but also covers uh, social and uh, uh, philosophical studies, uh, trying to bring these, these different concepts together. Um, but unfortunately, while the, the, the framework uh, nicely explains how these things are uh, related, in what sense these things are related, it doesn't mention how to use it in order to make systems that are uh, value, value compliant. So it uh, explains uh, what the relations are between the values, the values of the stakeholders and the technical artifacts that are the result. It doesn't explain how did you what kind of steps did you have to take, what kind of methods you can use in order to create a system that is uh, compliant with, with ethical and moral, uh, uh, moral values. Uh, moreover, the, uh, especially the, uh, the, the integration of the conceptual and empirical elements are rather obscure. So uh, the relation between conceptual, uh, the, the values and the, 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 the stakeholder uh, view on those values is rather clear. But how to get from those towards the technical artifacts is, uh, is not well written. Um, it's also not entirely sure or not, not entirely clear what the values are that uh, the framework talks about. In a later paper, Bacha did cover this and did uh, refine this. Um, but still, um, value sensitive design really looks at the results of the process and not so much about the process itself. So it doesn't really tell you how to get from values towards a, a compliance system. Which means that there's a very large gap between this theoretical fr framework and the application uh, in practice. So using value sensitive design uh, in, uh, in, in 
uh, software engineering or AI design uh, um, um, projects is rather difficult. <clears throat> Uh, and as shown by uh, the paper by uh, Winkler and Spiekerman, uh, over the last 20 years, there have been uh, uh, only a number of projects which actually used value sensitive design with success. Uh, and even more so, they only tackled a few aspects of the tripartite uh, methodology instead of using it wholly. Um, so the inclusion of value sensitive design, even though it has been around for 20, 20 years or so, uh, is still not really applicable in the, uh, in the design practices of today. So what are we trying to do here? What, what is our aim? So foremost, we would like to, to, uh, to create or to, to uh, uh, elaborate on the methodological process of including values into the design process. Um, so this is not about checking the ethics of the system while, when the system is built, but it's about making sure or creating an environment in which ethics are taken into account during the design of the system. Uh, on the right here, the, the, the typical trolley problem, which is often cited when we're talking about ethics and uh, ethical decision-making. Uh, and as an engineer, I think this is a very silly example because it's about uh, making moral decisions in a situation that actually shouldn't have happened. And as an engineer, I wonder why and how did we get in this situation in the first place? So for me, it's more about uh, making sure that the values and the ethics are taken into account during the design of the system, instead of trying to solve what kind of ethical decisions should be made when the system is actually applied and the system is applied. Um, that's more of the, the, the large scale focus, so the long term vision that we have. Um, in this paper, we really looked at, okay, so there is value sensitive design. It's been around for 20, 20 or so years. Um, the ideas have been there for, uh, for 20 or so years. How much of this has already been uh, uh, integrated into different design methodologies such that we can achieve indeed this uh, value oriented uh, AI development? In order to find out how much of uh, value sense design and values uh, in, uh, in general have been uh, into, uh, uh, integrated into AI engineering methodologies, we, uh, we did a literature study. Uh, we did a keyword search on, uh, on value sense design, AI and methodologies, uh, which resulted in only 21 papers. Uh, again, there's plenty of papers which are about AI and ethics, but all of these are about the, uh, uh, the conceptual uh, uh, connection between ethics and AI, uh, and there are many of those. We're really looking for uh, papers that cite the, the, the steps that you need to take in order to bring uh, ethics uh, and morality into the AI design. So only 21 papers uh, from that, uh, that particular literature search, uh, and after close examination, we only found that five of them were actually relevant to what we're looking for. Uh, we were a bit disappointed by this amount, so we extended our search. Uh, we uh, um, acknowledged that AI engineering, uh, perhaps uh, as, an, as a methodological framework, isn't as rich as, uh, uh, as, it, uh, as it could be. Uh, AI development, of course, is a, is a subfield of software assisted engineering. So we broadened our search to, uh, to a literature search where we also searched for value sensor design or values or ethics in uh, software and engineering methodologies, which resulted in a total of 961 papers, uh, of which we selected 45 based on their title and, uh, and abstract, so briefly reading the papers. And after ref uh, refinement, so uh, further reading, introduction and conclusion, uh, we, we found 11 relevant papers that discussed some parts of uh, methodological steps uh, and included some, uh, some way of, of dealing with values. Uh, after further reading, there were three more eliminated, which were uh, actually not quite relevant, uh, we're talking about education and stuff. So we had eight papers uh, remaining. Looking at each of these, so from the five AI papers that we, uh, that we found, there was actually only one of them which were, was explicit about the methodological steps of how to integrate uh, uh, values into, uh, uh, into AI development, which was a paper by Colton and Robbins van Weinsbergen, uh, which was very recent, only from last year. 
which describe the project in which they, uh, they used value sensitive design like uh, methodological steps in order to solve the value conflicts that arise when uh, redesigning drones for using them to transport uh, blood between uh, hospitals, uh, so using them for, uh, for medical transportation. Um, the other papers were either not uh, um, specifying uh, the use of values or not talking about the, the concrete methodological steps required to get to the, to the end result. So there was nothing in there that could be replicated in other projects. Um, within the papers on software and system engineering, we found a number of interesting methodologies um, listed here. So value-based system engineering, uh, value-based requirement engineering, uh, in specific uh, ethics and multi-view, uh, and the concepts of system thinking, soft systems engineering, critical systems thinking, uh, and finally the uh, methodology of SPADE, which is uh, also quite recent from 2008. The other ones are much older, um, but all of them uh, focusing on the more softer aspects of, uh, of system and software engineering. So uh, trying to open up the system engineering field to more social aspects. They typically talk about uh, value in the way of economic value. So not about reputation or, or fairness or, or discrimination. Um, but at least all of these uh, frameworks showed some potential to include uh, some of these more social and moral value aspects uh, in, their, uh, uh, in their framework. Uh, the SPADE framework itself was rather interesting because uh, it's specifically designed to talk about uh, sustainable development and in that sense taking into account more, uh, more social and more moral uh, elements than the other frameworks. Uh, but still, uh, it doesn't uh, explicitly mention how the, the sustainable values are elicited from the, from the stakeholders. So how that the engineer should, uh, should think about which elements of sustainability it should tackle, leaving it more of an implicit step in the methodology rather than an explicit step in the methodology. It was rather a shame, uh, but nothing to do about that. Um, so all of these in a sense, uh, allow you for more the more softer side of system engineering and the inclusion of social or moral uh, moral values. But as I mentioned, either the framework itself uh, is focus on uh, on economic value uh, and doesn't really mention or doesn't detail how to broaden that towards more social uh, uh, values like trust and and uh, discrimination, non discrimination, uh, fairness, etc. Um, and in that sense, also all of these lack the, the methodological steps that they require to, to translate uh, the, the moral values uh, in towards uh, um, particular elements that can be used in the, uh, in the design process. So concluding what we have found, um, on the one hand, we have uh, value sensitive design, which is there for, uh, for 20 years now, uh, rather philosophical uh, and unfortunately not concrete enough to, to really be used in the engineering practice. Uh, on the other hand, there's the, uh, the practical methodologies, so the, the long lasting methodologies from, uh, from system engineering and software engineering, which show the potential of inclusion of, of uh, moral values but are not clear on how to do that. Um, but somewhere in the middle, I hope there's, there's some way that the, the, these two uh, approaches can reach each other. Um, looking at different projects from each of these examples, we've only uh, identified one uh, that uh, indeed used values explicitly in the design with a description of how it has been done that can be replicated in other studies. Uh, which shows some, uh, uh, some potential to look at, um, but it's still a, a first project. It's only from last year. So we still have to see how, whether this is an academic uh, exercise or it's actually replicable in a, in a concrete industrial uh, environment. Um, and uh, as mentioned, the, the while values and value sensitive elements are av available in, in some uh, design frameworks, uh, unfortunately, it leaves uh, lots uh, um, 
up to the, the designer and the, uh, you know, the people using the framework, which means that the choice uh, of values is um, unguaranteed. It's not guaranteed that values are uh, indeed uh, incorporated into the, the process. It leaves uh, uh, unstructured, uh, no concrete steps, how to do this, what to do with it. Um, so when you have a good designer that is knowledgeable about the ethics, the frameworks allow you to use it and uh, allow you to do some sort of value sensitive design in a practical sense, but there's no concrete uh, replicable steps that you can teach, for instance, new engineers how to do this, which is a rather shame. Um, in our search, we, um, um, we acknowledge that we've so far only looked at, uh, at academic papers. So uh, there's, there's still, of course, the, the industrial practice where um, it might surprise us, but uh, maybe there is something out there um, where in industry people have already discovered how to use values and how to tackle ethics into, uh, into their design processes in a concrete way. So we can learn from that. It's a next step to find out whether there's something there that we can build upon. Uh, and of course, our long-term aim is to uh, describe or create uh, uh, an environment in which uh, the design of AI systems is done in such a way that at least some uh, guarantee can be given on the uh, integration of values and, uh, and ethics into the AI system. That's my talk. Thank you for your attention uh, and I'm available for questions. Thank you for your talk. Good. And as we could see on the last slide, uh, is also from Utrecht, from Hogeschool Utrecht. So, who has questions connecting to this interesting talk? Monique, please. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Um, as you went, as you search for literature, you kind of ended up with um general requirements engineering literature rather than specifically uh, artificial intelligence based so i am wondering now to what extent do you think it still makes sense to look specifically for artificial intelligence or would you expect that the values and the concerns that you will encounter and the, the, the type of decisions you need to make would be the same uh, in artificial intelligence systems engineering as in general systems engineering? Yep, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, no, indeed, uh, when looking at, uh, um, at AI in specific, there's very little to, to be found. Um, so there were two um, choices we had to make there. Either we could look at trying to find specific uh, methodologies for specific AI technologies. So right now we looked at methodologies for AI in general, but we could also say, for instance, look for uh, methodologies for agent systems or methodologies for machine learning, um, sort of making that more concrete. Um, but indeed, I believe that um, the inclusion of values, uh, as sort of seen by the, the value sensitive design framework by, uh, by Bartja Friedman, which is not necessarily a software engineering framework, uh, it's more of a design engineering framework. So it, it could also uh, be used for architecture, for instance. Um, I think that the, the incorporation of value and ethics into design is a much broader question than just for engineering and for software engineering in particular, um, which is also why we brought into system and software engineering. Um, however, I also think that um, with, uh, especially with upcoming legislation on trustworthy AI, the, the need for including values into the design for AI is much more prominent than for any other software system. Um, so I'm expecting much more uh, to be coming uh, in the field of AI on, on, this, uh, on this aspect and hopefully the design uh, methodologies there uh, and the inclusion of, uh, of, of values into soft, uh, in AI systems can benefit software engineering in a whole. 
Thank you. Thank you. Victor raises his hand, so please go ahead, Victor. So thank you for uh, the, the interesting uh, presentation. Um, I, I was thinking, like, in many cases, when, when there are AI systems, uh, it requires, not always, but uh, in many cases, data that may come from many different people. I'm thinking, for example, uh, at AI algorithms that Facebook may use, for instance. Uh, and I was wondering if you had any insights on how we could uh, even consider to, to, to consider the values of the users when it's at such a scale. Because I would expect that if you take into account the values of the users and you have billions of users, then you will have a lot of conflicts in those values. Uh, maybe much more than in other systems where you don't need uh, the involvement of that many people or you don't have the involvement of that many people. So I was wondering if you if you had any uh, insights on, on this uh, on this question. Thank you for your question. It's a very interesting question. It's not something that I uh, thought about earlier, but it's a very um, uh, a challenging um, um, aspect, I, I believe, for the inclusion of, of values in AI systems, or at least for creating morally responsible systems in such a field. Uh, because uh, especially the uh, the perception of the values that are at stake here, uh, research has shown that um, different countries and different cultures have different perception on these uh, on the particular values, for instance, on, on privacy of data. So uh, the kind of system that you talk about where we're, we're really gathering information around the, the entire globe, um, sort of makes it difficult to, to make a system where you could adhere to the values of each of the different cultures involved. Um, but then again, either the question is, should you want to des design a system where some cultures do not agree with whatever you're, you're building? Or should your system be limited in such a way that it uh, uh, adheres to the, the value perceptions of each of the different cultures that are involved? And it's it's a it's a designer question. What kind of what do, what's your audience? What's your scope? What's your scale? Um, but from a from a ethical point of view, of course, uh, if the whole world is your uh, your target audience, then you should listen to the whole world and you should include values from the whole world. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your answer and again for the presentation. Thank you. Maybe one short question from my side. You, you mentioned that you would like to achieve a method which enforces engineers to yeah, adhere to, at least reflect about uh, values. Um, do, do you think that, it's a general question, do you think that methods can enforce people to do something? Isn't it, aren't methods in the end always meant to be suggestions for, for how to act? Um, don't they have to be adapted to any situation anyway? So can they really enforce something? Uh, thank you, Jens. That's a, that's a very good point. Um, so uh, enforcing is perhaps too strong a word. So what I'm looking for is uh, general awareness of the inclusion of ethics in design, uh, uh, in design frameworks. So right now we teach our students uh, software design. And in some other course, you teach your students ethics, ethics of design. And I think this is wrong. I think that the, the, uh, the ethics in design should be taught at the same time as you talk about uh, design uh, design frameworks and design methodologies. So mm -hmm. instead of creating something where uh, where engineers are forced to think about the ethics, uh, I'm looking more for the kind of frameworks that you pick up uh, that speak about how to incorporate ethics into the design as a way to trigger engineers to think about, oh, that's right, I should think about ethics while I'm designing, when I'm busy with the first requirements as elicitations. I should also think about 
lesser direct stakeholders like society and what they would want from this system. Uh, to, to be sure that the engineers are aware that uh, there's also these ethical issues that are required to think about when you create an AI system. And the intertwinement between both, between the technical uh, designing and the ethical reflection, it's, it's obvious that both things go together in, in one, one process. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So, I don't see any further hands risen. It's exactly nine o'clock in the evening in Melbourne. Yeah, so thank you everybody for having stayed in this session <laughs> this late. Um, yeah, thanks especially uh, to, the, to the speakers, but also to the audience for asking your questions. And I hope that the next editions, both of the BC4S workshop and the Immobile workshop, will take place in a physical uh, session again on the next, maybe on the next Kaiser conference. And we, we might meet there then in person. That would be very nice. Thanks, everyone, again. And I think we can close this session now then. Thank Have you. a nice rest of the conference. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.